Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray. And we are here with somebody that was on the other side of me for a long time. He was the enemy. He'd be on the other side of the court in the opposite player box. I'd be giving him evil, evil looks. We we both looking at the, the chair umpire to make the right call for our player. Um, he's a he's a super agent. He's represents a lot of the world's most popular players. Um, and we'll go through some of the names, but this is uh Marine Ball. This is uh one of the big boys at IMG. Marine, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kamal. I appreciate it. Uh, you're getting me all rattled up when you start talking like that. But I remember many of the battles I had against you and your players, but uh, always in good sport. And I had the oh. chance to work with you for a while, so not all too bad, right? Oh, yeah, it's all good. I remember we were, it was the summer of 2017. It was like Kvitova, right? We played Kvitova like two tournaments in a row, played Vika twice that, you know, twice, like maybe once that year and twice the next year. I was like, man, this dude is like on the other <laughs> side of me too often, yeah. you know what I mean? The enemy, yeah. and then we finally yeah. got a chance to work together. But that's a testament yeah. to you because those are two big names. Uh, Thanks, man. So, so tell me how you got into tennis because I always feel like tennis is the ultimate good old boys network. And if you don't know somebody, if you're not somebody's best friend, if you're like not a former NCAA champ, it's sort of hard to enter this sphere. How did you get into this sphere? Yeah, I mean, um, Kamal, first of all, thanks for having me. It's fun to talk to you uh, in this kind of capacity. Uh, you know, most of the times that we see each other, it's about coaching or either playing against each other or, you know, we work with each other. But uh, thank you for having me. Um, you know how you get in to answer your first question. You're a little bit right. You need to know somebody and you got to, you know, be in the circle and you need a little luck. That's for sure. Um but I think you sometimes create your own luck. Um, to portray to myself, as you know, I'm Dutch, born and raised, and uh, I was a very mediocre uh, tennis player myself in juniors in Holland. Uh, no sign to ever become a professional of any kind, but I was good enough to play in college. So I uh, came to the US in 2004. Uh, I got a scholarship to play Division II tennis. Um, I told my mom I was going to do it for six months and come back home and start at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, nearly 19 years later, I'm still here. So. Didn't work quite out that way that I promised her at the time, but uh, I, I did four years of college tennis and then I was very, very lucky. I got an unpaid summer internship at IMG in the summer of 2008. Um, no guarantees of a job whatsoever, um, just a two month internship and we'll see where the ship goes. And uh, at 5 p.m. on the Friday of the last week of my internship, when I was handing in my computer, I was getting to use those two months. They, um, they set me down and they offered me a job as an assistant. So, uh, you know, I didn't even look at the paper. I didn't even care what I was going to get paid. I just wanted the opportunity. And um, I signed it right there on the dotted line. And um, yeah, that's how I started my career. I was an assistant for, you know, three, four years learning the ropes um, of what it takes to be a tennis agent. Uh, and in our business, an assistant isn't someone that makes copies or brings coffee, but you're working with an agent or two agents for me at the time that you learn under and learn the business. And, um, you know, after three, four years, they give you they give you the wings. You know, they think, you know, by the time you've proven that you understand how the business works, you've built your relationships, you've built your connections. And then they say, well, go to this junior tournament and go sign the next uh, Roger Federer, or Maria Sharapova. And, and so I did. <laughs> so, so tell us about because the internship with this generation, I think, you know, you said unpaid internship. Right. And I could yeah. I could see a. 19 or 21 year old thinking all right next no thanks right i gotta live in la for two months i'm not gonna make any money i kind of like believe i deserve what i want right now tell me about the experience at the unpaid internship at that point were you making copies were you like ushering a player to photo shoot tell us about the unpaid version first because i think to get in this door at a big firm like img yeah. mm -hmm. it's like you hear about p diddy talks about how he started right paid and Kanye and so few people are willing to sort of invest in himself right yeah. tell us about that, that experience yeah I mean it's a good point that you're making because I think uh, today's generation is quite different than it was when I uh, did my internship in 2008 uh, which is nearly 15 years ago and for me it was all about 
just give me the opportunity. Let me put my little foot in the door and I will prove you that I'm the best thing that's ever going to happen to you. And I took that attitude into that internship. I I was uh, doing the internship at the IMG Academy in Bradenton. Um, and I was working, I promise you, I was working 19 hours a day. Not that they made me do that, but I did it myself. I, you know, I was uh, rooming with a bunch of like the summer uh, coaches that were teaching tennis while I was working on the agency side. Um, and they were going out and partying every night and drinking. And I was sitting in my little room that they assigned to me just till 4 a.m., you know, pumping out uh, ideas, proposals, uh, pitches, sending emails, and just trying to prove myself, just to show them that I wasn't afraid of working hard, that I was going to go to whatever limit it was going to take me to to get there. And I guess that was the right call, because at the end, they offered me a job, which was all I was ever dreaming of, you know? Yeah. And I think that's a testament, because I find a lot of people who play college tennis, obviously, with those with the, with the, the rooms that tennis puts you in, you can go work on Wall Street, right? It puts you in the best boardrooms in the world. It, it does. puts you in seats next to people who own their own firms. And I always encourage people, even if you are not going to go pro, stay as connected to this game as possible because this mm-hmm. is like the top tier of wealth and business people, this and golf, right, in the world. And if you want to stay close to the game, I think one of the things we can do better as a sport is like have a college tennis to careers pipeline of all the jobs that exist in tennis, whether it's commentating behind the camera agency. So you talked about when you got first got a chance to get to become an agent, they send you to the junior tournament, like, like La Petitas and Eddie Herr and Orange Bowl, Easter Bowl. Tell me about that because I often, you know, I deal with a lot of juniors and they say, come out, you know, I'm top 50 in the world, ITF, made a junior slam, won a couple rounds. How do I know? No one's coming to knock on my door, right? To offer me half a million bucks, right? To try my hand at the tour. So when you go to junior tournaments now, and I know you're like deep in the business, so you still keep a pulse on the next upcoming juniors as well. What do you look for? And what advice would you give to a parent that's like, I think my kid's good. They haven't won a junior slam, but they're in all four. How do I know whether I go spend a year or two in college or whether or not I sign with an agency? I mean, it's a fantastic question you're asking me. And I think it's actually a two-folded answer because I think you're weaving two questions into one, right? So first, let's look at it from my perspective. So when I go to a, you know, a junior tournament or when I see a young talent, I compare it to buying a house. Have you ever bought a house? I'm sure you have. Can. Right. <laughs> so, but, you know, when you go buy a house, you're going to go visit a, a house or you're looking at 10 and it's like, okay, is this house in the right neighborhoods? Does it have the right lighting? Does it have potential to, if I invest some money in it to, you know, to build out, to renovate? And for me, when I look at a player, it's kind of the same question, right? Is it in the neighborhood that I like? Is it surrounded by the people that I think are going to bring that player to the, you know, to the next level? Does that player have the potential just like my house have to that if I invest in it, if I if I upgrade it, is it going to do better for me? Uh, is it in the you know, does it have enough light? Does it have enough potential? That's, I compare it to really like buying a house. Uh, where is the house located in the right neighborhood? AKA, where's the player from? Like what, you know, what country are they from? Does it make sense? So there's a lot of those similarities that go into when you go in my field from my side of the table to go recruit a player. Now, the second part of your question is like, okay, so what if I am that player? And, you know, I've maybe done well in a couple of slams. I think you have to always be realistic with yourself because tennis is a very, very difficult sport to make to the top echelon. And as much as we want it, only a very small percentage of kids or young teenagers that we see that are, are have potential will ultimately end up making it, right? So you have to be you have to be honest with yourself first like is this what i want is or is it more what my parents want is this something where i think i can dedicate my life to because that's what it takes and if you're not in a category and like you see many people and i'm a perfect example of that like i never had the potential to become a professional tennis player but i played college tennis in the us and i made an amazing career of it you know i have a, a fantastic job my dream job and it was only because as an eight-year-old, I started hitting against the yellow tennis ball. So many times I tell, you know, 
juniors or recruits that, you know, ask me the question, do you think it's good for me? And if I'm not sure, I will tell them that too. And I say, listen, I think you have the chance, but you know what, maybe if you go to college for a year, it'll give you a different perspective. And maybe that is the better route for you. But of course, if I see the next 12 year old or 13 year old or 14 year old that really has a potential, like we're all in. Mm -hmm. So we talk about being all in, right? Because, you know, there's like, um, you know, a, a young tennis player who would need, you know, they're, they're kind of buddy, maybe they're doing well in a few junior slam, doing, you know, win, Eddie Hurwinch orange ball, but they need financial assistance Yeah. To, to really organize. I mean, you get so many people that like do well in juniors that don't have a trainer, mm -hmm. don't really yeah. do any gym work. They're just winning yeah. these tournaments off of just racket skills, right? And the mom yeah. says, oh, well, if I had, you know, 300 grand or 400 grand, I could get a real team. I could get a trainer. I could move to Florida, California, wherever. So what type, how do, what's a good deal, right? Because agencies also give players an upfront investment, which obviously we're going to invest money in you, give you this cash. It's restricted for coaching, travel, whatever, and you're going to pay it back, right? And to me, that's like the ultimate sign because I've, I've, I don't know that I've ever really seen agencies miss the mark like if an agency mm -hmm. gives somebody some money that means okay they know what good looks like they know what someone mm -hmm. who can make a living looks like that's when they invest in so tell me when like what's a good deal for a player if you saw a good deal a, a player who's maybe u.s or french right tall you know the, you know all the all the bells and whistles right what how would you come in and support that player so they can graduate from winning Orange Bowl to then maybe getting to more, you know, ITF events globally? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good uh, question and a very complicated one because no two situations are the same, right? Everybody has a little bit of a different structure. One player may be being supported by the Federation, so they may not be so much in need of that financial support, but others come from absolutely nothing. So when we believe like this is the next future superstar, we'll put all our thinking caps on and say, what does this player need in order to succeed? And of course, it starts with a financial picture to, in order to afford traveling, afford a coach, maybe a physio, like the whole setup. You mentioned, you know, the agency investment. Um, does that happen sometimes? Yes, it does. But at the same time, we I can speak from an IMG side of view. We're not a bank, right? But of course, there are situations where that may happen. Um, at the same time, we know all the the investors in the sport, the, the Nikes, the Adidas, the ASICs of the world, the racket companies, there's private investors. So there's several ways that you can structure like, you know, a budget for a player. And, you know, each player is a little different. Uh, some have, you know, a coach has been dedicated to that kid for a long time and that wants to invest his own time, effort and money into it. So every, every combination or every situation is a little different, but usually you'll find a way. Mm. So how young is too young, right? So we obviously, like now we go to, you know, Le Petitas and we see uh, Little Mo, right? We got like this 10, 11, 12, 13. How young is too young? Like, do you say, okay, I'm gonna keep my eye on this 13 year old, mm -hmm. but I won't start sort of recruiting them, perhaps considering an investment in them until they're mm -hmm. 16 or 17. Yeah. To be honest with you, if uh, if you asked me this question five years ago, I would give you a different answer than I give you today. We would, for sure, when we see an 11 or 12 year old, never put a paperwork in front of them, you know, even if we believe they had that potential, but we would just help them and monitor them and, and guide them. You know, we don't have to do that right away. But if you go to Petitas now, today, next year, or last year or the year before, every kid there has an agent already. So the business is moving a lot younger. So because kids are getting signed at 11, 12 years old sometimes because that's what you know some of the competitors are doing. So it forces everybody to go younger. Um, it's, again, it's very different now than it was five, 10 years ago, for sure. Now, do you find, like I find that girls peak younger than boys. Agreed. So, you know, is the, do you... Do you think the same way where, you know what, we'll invest younger in a girl than we would in a boy? 
I don't I don't think so, but definitely I think the the, the it skews a little older, like the boys, like you say, boys develop a little bit later. It's sometimes a little bit harder to tell. You know, they may look fantastic at 12, 13, but you know, they they may you know develop slower at a later age where the girls are you know much younger at 12 13 you can definitely tell you know where it's going to end um mm -hmm. but i wouldn't say it changes the mindset of we're signing someone younger or later i, I wouldn't say that and again I i'm i'm generalizing things here but every situation is a little bit different right mm -hmm. each one has their own individual path and i think that's also the beauty of the sport not everybody is at the best at 16 or becomes world number one at 18. There's so much variety. So each time that you look at that house that you're trying to build, um, you're, you're you're analyzing, you know, how, what, where, when, and more than ever today, I can tell you, it depends on who the people, uh, who are the people that this player surrounds themselves with. This is so key. You can be have all the talent in the world. You can look like a million bucks at 13, but if you don't have the right structure at 16, you won't be playing tennis anymore. So for us, this is like very, very important. It's almost more important than how good the kid actually is at that age. We look more at the long-term potential than where it stands today. Because many times when you go to a junior, junior tournament, the kid that actually wins the under 12 or the under 14s, historically never becomes a Wimbledon champion, right? It's sometimes the kids that lose in the second round or that lose in the quarterfinals or that win the back draw. So you have to always, don't stare yourself blind on results. Of course they matter, but there's so much more to it. I know, I look at a lot of kids in 14 and I, be, and I, I, I say, that kid's hitting that ball to the fence. But once they find the range, that's going to be a big forehand. You know what I mean? Like, Exactly. Exactly. Ball, at 12 and 13, the ball that hits the curtain five or six times ends up being a, one of the biggest forehands in the game a lot. You know what I mean? So exactly. Yeah. So before we go to the pros, because you got some great pros that you work with and some great stories, uh, NIL, right? You know, college tennis used to be like a death sentence to a, a pro tennis career, right? It was like, oh, you going to college, yeah. you're done. But we've seen yeah. in Brady, Mackie McDonald, Nakashima, we've seen people make you know, have a successful year or two in college and then turn to a good pro. Um, NIL is a whole different thing, right? Are you all dibbling into the NIL space in tennis at all? I would say um, we in particular uh, are, are looking at it. Let's call it that way. I don't think the NIL uh, rules and regulation changes for, uh, for tennis or for sports in general have had such a big effect on tennis just yet. I think, uh, you know, basketball obviously and football have a lot more potential and impact on that. I think NIL and tennis is, has a potential, but I don't think it's as active and, 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 and on the forefront of what we're trying to do yet as much as it's in the other sports. Mm. Because I think the college tennis path is still very much the same as the John Isner days. And, you know, it's a, it's a development school where, you know, some will make the way through and actually get better and others come to realization that that's the plateau. So I don't, we don't see that NIL is changing that just yet as much as it does in other sports. Yeah. So you're live from Turin. Yeah. At the Edo ATP finals and you're mm -hmm. there with Casper Rude. Yeah. Um, and when I think about Casper Rude, I think about somebody we had heard about, right? Obviously he's got tennis pedigree, right? Mm -hmm. We had heard about him, but he got really good, really fast. Yeah. So tell me about, and obviously when I think about you, I think about Benchit, Azarenka, Kvitova, Pui. Tell me about a wild ride. Like I personally can think about some wild rides. I think of like US Open run in 2017. I think about Miami, you know, 2018 Miami. I think of just some, some weeks or two weeks where it was just like, holy shit what is going on right and like you're like in this and i think the player sort of lost in just the matches but mm -hmm. the team the agent the coach the parents looking like holy shit, we like this this is special right tell me about like can you can you take me to a week or two weeks with a player where it was just a wild life-changing ride for the player uh, well, I, I have a few. It's hard to pick. And and I mean, these stories are endless. So it could fill like three hours of your podcast with that. But um, a few that come to mind. I mean, Monica Puig in 2016 at the Rio Olympics. Um, 
I'm sure you can imagine what that looked like. Uh, what comes to mind uh, really special was Petra Kvitova in January 2019, Australian Open final to play against Naomi Osaka. After what happened to Petra in at the end of 16 with the hand and who knows if she was ever going to touch her racket again. And she played the, the final in Australia against Naomi for world number one. The winner of that match was going to be world number one for the first time and win the Australian Open for the first time. Um, so that, you know, that was actually, you know, from an emotional standpoint, like one of the wildest rides I've ever been on. I, I don't think I slept for 72 hours before she won the semis and then I didn't sleep until two days after the final. That's how much that, you know, goes in your head. Um, but then this, you know, and I come back to this year, what Casper did, and that's how you let in the question, you know, the final at the French Open and then at the US Open, just just magical. Um, you know, I, I saw Casper play for the first time when he was 15, actually. Um, I signed him when he was 16. And you know, like he he had he had a very different trajectory than some of the other guys had, and he steadily made his way up the rankings. And then this year was, you know, last year obviously he showed what he's capable of, and this year was just totally off the charts and he deserves everything he's done. And he, him and his team have worked so incredibly hard and so diligent and Talking about a great environment, what I just talked told you about young players. I mean, just top notch in every every part of the, part of the way, you know. And everybody, I think, had the, had the idea he has a potential to do well at the French Open, maybe win it one year. And you know, he did that this year, making the final against his idol Rafa. Um, and then in in New York, you know, making the run and playing against Carlos again. Uh, going back to nineteen was you know winner of the U.S. Open final was going to be world number one and win win that Grand Slam and you know you have set points in the third set and you know you're feeling pretty good about yourself when you're sitting there and when that happens uh, and then and then you know it doesn't happen so you know those are, those are, you know the, those are very you know emotional roller coasters you go through but um, yeah so it's it's just I'm I'm very lucky I'm very privileged it's you know I. I love my job. I I will ne I never wake up in the morning uh, thinking like I'm going to work. I'm always excited about what the day has ahead of me because I get to work with amazing athletes, with amazing people that do amazing things. And I'm just very lucky to help them enable to reach their full potential, you know, in, in, in doing that. So yeah, there, there've been, there've been some wild rides and these are just some highlights. So when I think about like a two week slam, right, let's say someone's, you know, perhaps uh the first right like cash mm -hmm. the same french open yeah and you know i think about you know, like the teams i've been on where we gotta start deep and like all right after we get to week one we gotta have a meeting the parent the mm -hmm. agent all right let's have a meeting right because mm -hmm. tell me the phone starts ringing right when you get past week one of a slam the player mm -hmm. for the first time right the phone starts yeah. ringing yeah, the ticket requests go up, and I think, like, I know as a coach, I'm like, okay, all right, let's have a meeting. Player, go to your room. Parents, mm -hmm. boyfriend, trainer, agent. The draw's looking good. How do we not mess this up, right? How do we make sure right. we manage what's, you know what I mean? So, yeah. at what point during like a slam does that phone start ringing from an agent standpoint, right? Well, your job, like, okay, now it's like. I, I now I'm not sleeping because everything's happening. Now every family member wants to come. Now sponsors yeah. want to come or potential sponsors want to come or people yeah. offered us a deal. They want us to sign now. Do I really want to give them a contract before the round of 16, right? Or between the round of 16 and the quarter. Tell, tell me about like that. Um, the phone definitely starts ringing, as you said, at the beginning of the second week. Um, my philosophy is usually don't try to change something if you don't have to and keep it, keep it the same. Definitely don't let the player know that there's so much going on, right? Of course, you let the parents and the coach, you know, in on, you know, all the things that are coming through and nailing it specifically to Casper, obviously come from Norway, which is not a tennis hotbed uh, by any means. And it's more famous for its winter sports than anything else. Um, so you can only imagine how 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 full the flights from uh, from Oslo to Paris were, you know, during that second week, and how many people actually came, which was fantastic. But yes, you have to you have to you know build a wall a little bit and try to hold off. You know, your phone is obviously ringing a lot. People want many things from you, uh, sponsors, potential sponsors, and um, in particular, when you get to the semis, you're getting the approval emails, which are the ones that I never want to see. It says if he wins the tournament. 
we would like to do this. Can you please approve that? You know, when I see that, I'm like, okay, that's bad karma. Can't be doing that. Right. You know, I got to do my job because what happens if the final happens 10 minutes after the final, you know, that sponsor wants to put up that Instagram post and that congratulatory ad and it needs to be approved. So, you know, there's a, a lot goes through your head and there's a lot on your plate and you rarely sleep as you probably know. Um, so those are, those are hectic days, but we live and die for them. I wouldn't want it any, any other way. Yeah, I, I, like when you get to the end, you start to meet with the coach and say, okay, look, this is an opportunity. We probably need to sign now, right? Before the final, right? Or before yep. the semis. Because if you lose it, yeah. then the number gets cut 25%. <laughs> Should we do this, right? And the coach in his mind is like, okay, holy shit, let me make sure I got the game plan right. Let me make sure the practice is tight. Let me make sure I don't mess this up for the player because the mm -hmm. coach is aware of what's the, the stakes arising. Um, yeah. But how often does that happen where you got a deal and you're like, I kind of need to like get this sign now because if we don't win this next match, it can go down 30%, but I kind of don't mm -hmm. want to give contract to the player between matches. It happens, but I, I, I've got to be honest with you. I always bet on my player. I believe in my player. And even if that means we don't sign it now and it's, you know, it's going to look different, then they're also not the right partner. You know, if they say this is what it is now, and if you lose, it's going to be that, that's not the right partner for me. You know, you're either in or out, not based. If someone makes a Grand Slam final, they shouldn't be penalized for something new that's coming. So I, that conversation with me never sits very well. If someone pushes me like that, and I never make a player sign or agree to anything while they're in the tournament that opportunity will be there after the tournament. And if it's not, it's just not the right opportunity for you. That's how I see it. And if you do, if you do well, other opportunities are going to come. So we don't need to rush. Yeah. So let's talk about the service part of your job, right? I think that, you know, being a, being a sports agent sounds very glamorous. It does. But, you know, there's this thing called whereabouts right, where you've got to, like, input into the system everywhere your player is every day of the year so they can be drug tested and blah, 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 blah. You got to get the flight. You got to get, like, if if, we, if we're if we going to be on an airplane, we might just say, hey, can you get us a practice court, um, hotel, all this stuff. Tell us about how you manage so many players and still provide good service, right? Because there is a less glamorous part of the job in management that I think people don't see where that assistant agent comes in, right? Where exactly it's right. Like, exactly you know, right. And, and, and these things are very important because if the hotel's not right and a tournament gets off to a bad start, we're screwed from the start. You know what I mean? The exactly. slightest thing. Exactly. So there's a lot of pressure on your end to make mm -hmm. sure all the prep work is like tight. So that nothing yeah. like mentally sets a player off before yeah. leaving on the tennis court. Yeah. I was once asked by someone, what are some of the characteristics that a tennis agent need to have? And I can feel like a book, but you got to be forward thinking. You got to be always ahead, always thinking 10 steps ahead. You got to be active, proactive. You have to be making sure that everything is done perfectly. Less than perfect doesn't exist. And that same the same people that ask me those questions think being a tennis agent is the most glamorous job in the world to get to sit on center court Wimbledon every day and you know you're you're in drinking high tea you you know more than anyone that is definitely not the truth and you know rings under your eyes are a result of exactly this job because we are in in essence in a service servicing industry and we just may, need to make sure whether it's me or my assistant or someone who works with me that everything for the players is taken care of um, the hard job of an agent is sometimes just, just balancing, making sure everybody in the team knows what they're doing and is happy. And that, that's not always an easy thing because, you know, a tennis player usually has a coach around them. They got a, a parent, they got a trainer, they got a sponsor. How do you make sure that everybody is happy? Everybody's on the same page. Um, all the logistics are done, just like you said. And again, this forward thinking, you know, always making sure that everything is done correctly and on time. And without failure, and 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 that is a that is a stressful part of our job, but it is it is something we're very used to, and we do without blinking. Yeah, I always try to, you know, it, it maybe not always successful. I have to be the least the least picky person on a team. 
Yeah. About to play. And, and tennis players, you know, we can be about ourselves, right? And tennis coaches right. can get in their right. own hand and have their own sort of level of ego. Right. But when you think about the players like up here, right? Then you mm-hmm. got the parent of the player who's like really makes or breaks the team, right? They can mm-hmm. like, you know, sort of, they, this their kid. So they know how to like push buttons in their kid and that can just, uh, then you got the sponsor, you know, the coach really is like, bro, I'm good. Whatever, single bed, I'm good. Double bed, I'm good. Flight, this flight's good. You try to like not be that guy that's so high maintenance because the agent is dealing with, you know. Yeah, a lot, a lot goes on behind the scenes in terms of logistics to ultimately enable that player to perform at its best because that's why we do it, right? And exactly like you said earlier, the hotel needs to be ready so they can get sleep. They don't have to wait when they arrive. Simple things like that are always, you know, a very detail-oriented uh, logistical piece of the puzzle. And uh, we, we spend a lot of time on making sure that the players have what they need in order to perform best because our job is to enable them to perform at their best. And they can only do that when their life is as stress-free as possible and they have as little things to worry about. It's our job to worry about those things. So let's let's present a scenario where you have two of your players that are playing each other, quarter mm-hmm. cent of a slam. Which side do you sit on? Or do you find a common seat up in the rafter somewhere? You see that last seat in the stands over there right. in the corner? <laughs> That's where you sit. <laughs> that is that is the, sometimes the really painful part of the job. That you know, if you uh, manage more than one player, that they play each other, and it's just something that you um, have to accept. And and the players usually know and they understand that, of course. Um, but it also gives a sense of pride. I've sat in that in that last seat in the rafters a few times, and you know, I take a picture on my phone, and I feel pretty proud because you feel very responsible for both of those athletes that are giving it their all that are competing at the hardest against each other. And it gives you a sense of pride that those 15,000 people that are sitting, you know, in Indian Wells or the 25 that are sitting at Arthur Ashe stadium, that they're coming to watch your talent or the one, the talent that you're responsible for and you enable them to be there. So it's a, it's a proud moment, but it's, it's a tough moment that you can be cheering for one side or the other. Yeah. So when I think, you know, like I love tennis, right? And I and I love the business of tennis. But I also I also think that we are small enough where as a sport we should be more nimble, right? When mm-hmm. I see other sports innovating quickly, whether it's from bringing in betting sponsors before tennis did, or bringing in like logos on court, like NBA, you got logos on the baseline now, right? Um, they've changed the way fans sit like near the scoreboard now between the scoreboard and the bench, right? Where it's like mm-hmm. a few premium seats. I see other sports sort of evolving. Uh, and yeah. sometimes I see tennis being very traditional, right? And resistant yeah. to change. You know, what are one or two things? And I see it on the coaching side. I see, I see a lot of professionals that are not players trying to find a way to make a good living in the sport. Mm-hmm. but struggling to do so right tennis coaches aren't making a million bucks you know what i mean so but we want to stay close to the game but you also have to feed your family you know what i mean right and i was right. like if the sport continued to grow and evolve everyone in the sport would benefit from it and perhaps there are great minds great coaches great trainers that are choosing to work in other sports or work in a corporate america because tennis can't offer them the kind of living that even a corporate job can, right? Or, you know, being an NBA trainer can. And so what are some things you think we can do as a sport to sort of rise the tide so that all the, you know, all the ships can sort of make more money, be happier, um, maybe have some coaches and minds come back to the game, you know what I mean? Right. That maybe said, yeah, you know, I can go make more money elsewhere. Right. I mean, first of all, you just said something that's music to my ears and you're preaching to the uh, preaching to the choir. Right. Uh, it's if we grow the sport, everybody's going to benefit. It's if we grow the pie, everybody's going to get a bigger slice. Right. So that's I think in any answer I give you or any anything you say is the ultimate goal here. Um, I have a pretty strong opinion on this, and that is we need to highlight and grow and market our biggest stars better i mean we have we have seen 
in men's tennis for 15 or 18 years now we've had these amazing guys that you know roger rafa novak andy that have really dominated the sport and really upgraded it we've had that for example in women's tennis as well but i feel like it ultimately starts with the product on the court when you're talking about the nba or you're talking about major league baseball or the nfl Ultimately, the growth starts with the product that you put on the field. So I think it's our job as people that work in the industry to really nurture and grow our superstars, our young stars, in particular our young stars. I've been very active in, in that myself to try to help elevate and promote those young next generation up and comers because they're ultimately going to capture that young Gen Z audience that will help grow our sport. So for me, it really starts with the product on the court, on the field, and highlighting it, promoting it, growing it. Crossovers. I love crossovers with other sports. You're seeing this in Formula One a lot. They do a lot of crossover with other sports, other talent. I think we in tennis can do a good, a better job at that, you know? Whether it's with other sports, whether it's with entertainment talent, there's so much potential to, to use each other's audience and captivate new audience and captivate new people that don't know anything about sport about the sport so for me um that's the most the two most important parts the crossovers and and growing and marketing and highlighting our super our young superstars mm, mm. so what, what if somebody said you know we can only market roger novak rafa andy so much we need to market or people need to get to know the people that are 40 and below, right? Who right. are maybe from Croatia, from, you know, a, a, or a smaller country, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe we have them be ambassadors of that country. And I think, you know, there, there's that thought too, is that we need to market more people so that fans have the, the opportunity to attach themselves or more options for attachment. Um, because mm -hmm. what, you're, what you're saying is, I kind of agree with you, the NBA, M Michael Jordan grew the NBA, right. period, point blank. Magic right. Johnson grew the NBA, right? LeBron James, like everyone knows, don't mess with LeBron. He, he's carrying the NBA, right? You know what I mean? Like Steph Curry, they do a great job at picking three or four guys that are going to carry the whole league. And they operate under a different set of rules. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, even the NFL. Like, you better not injure Patrick Mahomes. Like, you can, right. you can tackle him or Tom Brady. You can tackle mm -hmm. him. But we're not trying to injure him and have him out for the season, right? And I think that mm -hmm. there's, like, these unwritten rules where we protect the face of the brand. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've we need to do that better. But do we also need to maybe highlight who's next? To get like that's a, my point. Yeah, that's exactly my point. It it means that young uh, superstar. I, I mean, I I can tell you myself. Uh, I work with Linda Frugertova. You know, who's seventeen years old. Won our first WTA tournament in the fall. Is sixty five in the world now. Um, you know, young superstar. Those kind of young players we need to highlight. They need to get an opportunity to play on a big court in front of a big audience, be on TV, because that's ultimately that's how people are going to see them. They don't want to see them for the first time when they're entering the top 10. I think they need to be seen when they are making their run in Miami, when they are making and they're, they're getting those opportunities later in the tournament when they get to the stage of playing like a big player uh, like Linda did in Miami this year. But I need they need to get those opportunities more often. So that, it, that we can capture that audience. That's not only live, but we live in a social media audience, right? So, you know, on the social pages, they need to be highlighted. They need to be put front and center as much as those top 10 players do. They, we need to use the, the popularity of those players to, to bring up the younger ones that ultimately are going to, you know, compete with them at that level or take their job, take their job, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, I don't know if you remember this. I remember... Uh, Monica was playing Sweet Attack, Sviante, mm -hmm. and yeah. you, you brought them down, you know, tickets to watch the match courtside, I think. And I look back, like, who's this little girl in the box? And I think it was her, or it was one of them, either her or Yeah, sister. you're right. You're right. It was, it was. that. This, you have good memory. Yes, it was. And I was like, oh, Ryan, that must be some... I set him, I, I set him in the row behind the player box, but again, yes. to my point, 
I did that because I wanted them to understand at a young age, I think Linda was maybe like 13 at the time. I wanted her to understand what it means to sit close, what to, un, to see what the team does, to how uh, people interact and behave, just to, to sniff it, you know, before they ever get to that stage. And it was pu a pure educational thing I did, but good, good memory. Oh, uh, yeah. A good tennis coach doesn't forget a thing. I still remember <laughs> points that cost me money in the past, like, you know, seven, eight years, <laughs> like, damn, you know, if, if we had won that point, then she probably would have double faulted the next point. And we would have, you know, made it two more rounds because the next round was a cupcake. I mean, like all these things go I have through. a few of those. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the time, man. You are, you're, you know, obviously one of the, the great minds, you know, great player list with Benchik, Vika, uh, Petra, Kvitova, Kasparu, Linda. So, you know, a lot of insight. And I think, you know, the agency piece is plays a big role in sort of the next generation in helping them think about their transition. Um, and I love the piece you touched on about who the player is around, because I think yeah. that the number one thing in tennis is the parent. I mean, like the student is like the pupil, but the client is the parent. Even at like nine, 10, 11, when the kid can like, is hitting a, a freaking orange ball. It's like, how do I get the kid good, but keep the parent happy so that they keep bringing the player and the parent doesn't feel like, ah, this is a waste of my time. Or, ah, I don't want to invest in this, right? It's like you're managing all those things even at the junior level. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, you're, you're, you're spot on by saying, like, you know, the number one thing is who is the player surrounded by and who's helping yeah. them interpret what's happening, like, right, right. now. You know right. what I mean? Um, and who's able yeah, to I actually mean, stay the parent? Because sometimes yeah. the player turns pro and the parent may, like, turn employee. Right. Right. And it's important that the parent always be able to still put your foot down and like get back in parent mode. Like, no, you're about to fuck this up. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's also an educational process. You know, most parents of a 13 year old or 14 year old or 12 year old, they've never done this before. So they only know what they know and what they interpret is the best thing to do. And maybe that's very contrary what you and I, who have so much experience, know what is best for them. And it's never a good idea to tell them you're wrong and I'm right, because that usually doesn't work like that, right? But if you show them, if you educate them in, in every single way, they ultimately will understand. And this is a big trust factor, of course, that comes with you know your personality and with everything you bring to the table as an agent to, to, to give them the confidence that I have the same interests as you have. And it is that your son or daughter or your pupil, if you're talking to the coach, becomes a Wimbledon champion or a U.S. Open champion. We want the same thing. So let's bond. Let's build this build this house together. And if you manage to 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 win that trust and to convince them of that trust, to show them the path, to sh take their hand and say, "I know how to get to the end of the road. Help me, follow me, and I'll help you." It usually turns out really well for everyone involved. Hmm. Well, man, you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate you. Uh, of course. It's, it's been great getting to know you on so many different levels, A, from first from Thanks, being man. a competitor and then from working together. Um, and, uh, you know, I really, I, I admire you. I admire your tenacity, your professionalism uh, and your work ethic. I mean, I see you running around, managing this, managing that, tickets. What can I do? You need anything? You need me to take the rackets? Uh, and I think that's also a good attribute to a good agent is being with whatever you need me to do whatever hole you need to fill, whatever we can do to keep this run going, I'm with it. You know what I mean? So I mean, listen, at the end, at the end of the day, our job as agents is to run the business, right? That's ultimately what our goal is. But there are so many more things that you just highlighted on that we do and that we're more than happy to do and we see as part of our job and I actually enjoy doing in order to, you know, to facilitate the success for everyone that's involved. And um that's what makes me happy every morning when I get up, that I get another opportunity, another day to to build, you know, and 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 it usually turns out pretty well if you if you go in with the right mindset. So well, I appreciate you, man. Good luck to Casper Rule. Thanks. First year in final. Um, no, he was here last year as well. Oh, last and he, year? Was, yep. he was in the semis last year as well. So um we're doing we're doing pretty good and uh you know, feeling confident for tomorrow and we'll see how it goes. 
All right, man. Well, this has been a tennis guy, tennis.com podcast with Ryan Ball. This, uh, I of, of IMG. Thanks for listening.